Okay, well, it took me 10 minutes to go over lipids, so here we are, part 3 of our macromolecules lesson. We're going to start with proteins. Proteins, when you're looking at functions in the body, proteins do many, many things. If you see a, t a question and you're not quite sure which macromolecule it's describing, it has a good likelihood of being a protein just because of how many things they do. So there's a hint for you, but it is good to, to know how they're different, but just in case. Proteins contain peptide bonds. That's why they're called polypeptides. So they're, they're still covalent bonds. We've just given these covalent bonds a special name. And you're also going to see as we go through, there are names for the different levels to their structure. They fold and form three-dimensional shapes, and so we've given different designations to like how far they've gone into that three-dimensional structure. Um, so we'll go over that. So there is an amino acid, and there's your carboxyl group, your amine group, and that R stands for an R group. There are 20 different R groups for the 20 different amino acids. So there's four amino acids side by side. And you can see that hydrogen and that hydroxyl group right there ready for condensation reaction or dehydration synthesis. And you remove those waters and that is where your peptide bond is going to form. Now they're not going to be that long and that's not exactly the arrangement. But you get the idea. It's that carbon to nitrogen bond where that carboxyl group used to be. That's your peptide bond location. So here's all your the functions of proteins. They're structural. So a lot of your body owes itself to protein structure. You can pull on the skin of your hand and it goes right back into place because of those elastins. It's a food source. Often in milk or in eggs, the protein, that's a food source. Transporter. We're going to talk so much about cell membrane transport. Those are all proteins of different shapes and sizes doing different things. Hemoglobin transports oxygen around with the help of Iron being associated with that protein. Hormones, insulin, I've talked about before, and homeostasis. Actin and myosin are two crazy cool proteins that we're going to look at when we talk about transport through the cells and muscle movement. You've got all your different antibodies, which are also called immunoglobins. So that's the Ig, and there's an IgE, IgA, IgG. And then your enzymes, and those you'll always be able to pick out because they end in A-S-E, amylase, proteases, lactase, and they generally refer to what they act on. So proteases break up or, or are involved with proteins. Lactase breaks down lactose, for example. So here are your four levels of protein structure. Now, if you're a bit thrown by this picture. We will go over this in class, probably with pipe cleaners, and I'll go over it in separate slides, but you've got a primary structure, which is just your sequence of amino acids. Those, because of various intramolecular connections, will form these pleated sheets or helices. All of those individual Secondary structures fold together into a tertiary or third level structure. And then if you take multiple chains all folded up into tertiary structures and put them together, you get the fourth level structure. So here they are again. Your primary structure is just that string of amino acids. It has a specific order and that's determined by your DNA but you're not considering the shape of the overall three-dimensional protein yet. Secondary looks at those helical shapes, these little common shapes, or the pleated sheets that have hydrogen bonds holding them together. Tertiary, oh, 
I'm getting ahead of myself. So here is a picture of uh, one of the skeletal models of an amino acid, and they've done that mesh to kind of show you where the actual electron cloud would extend to. And those are little waters, those little V-shaped pink and red. That's, that's actually a protein made to form a pore for water. And so this is what you can get when you have these helical shapes and things, different polar regions and nonpolar regions, very cool shapes that these proteins will fold into. And this is a simple one, very simple, just a channel for water. And then those yellow arrows, if you look there, that's pointing out the R groups, and some of those R groups are actually rings, fused ring structures. So some of the R groups can be very, very small, and some can be pretty large, those, those ring structures. Okay, tertiary structure. So secondary was just the helical shapes or the pleat shapes. Now we're looking at having those sheets and helical shapes fold onto each other, and that uses more hydrogen bonding. So lots of hydrogen bonds here holding these proteins together. And there is one special type of covalent bond. It forms between cysteine. That's one type of amino acid, and it has sulfur in it. So not all proteins contain sulfur, but some do when they have cysteine. And so there is what's called a disulfide bridge. So it's just you know, to give you the best sense of this I can in a two-dimensional space, you can see that the coils and the pleats, they're all going to fold onto themselves. And that's going to form spaces for reactants, for things to bind, for things to happen, because a lot of these proteins are going to be doing something in your body. And finally, we've got the quaternary structure. Not all proteins have to go this far to be functional, but some do. Hemoglobin is one of those. A functional hemoglobin requires four properly formed polypeptide subunits that then build into one functional hemoglobin molecule. The nucleic acids, I mentioned the examples before, your DNA and your RNA, they are named after their sugars, deoxyribose or ribose. Their main purpose is to be the code or the instructions for life. And that follows the central dogma of genetics. So you will see this again, that DNA makes RNA, and then RNA is the code for the protein. This is done in two steps. The first is called transcription, and the second is called translation. And all of these things will be discussed more later. We're also going to talk about RNA much more in depth later on because it has sm special functions that it does all by itself that is aside from you know, being the code and the instructions for life. So nucleotides in a monomer of a nucleic acid, there is one nucleotide. So you've got your base. This is a guanine. So we say G for short. Your deoxyribose sugar, this is a DNA nucleotide. It would be ribose in RNA. There's just a slight difference in the placements of some of the oxygens. And then you've got your phosphate group up there on the top. This bond here is called a phosphodiester bond. It is very similar to an ester. You can see the double bonded O and the O in between the carbon and the phosphorus. But because it is not two carbons, it's not an ester bond, it's a phosphodiester bond. We number the carbons. So there would be carbon one, two, three, four, and five. So starting at the oxygen, you go clockwise around one, two, three, four, five. So these are five carbon sugars. Ribose is also a five carbon sugar. And so if we put another nucleotide there, 
That's how they link together into long strands with their bases exposed, ready to hydrogen bond together. And so there is a second phosphodiester bond between carbon number three and a second phosphate group. So the bonds, the phosphodiester bonds, happen between carbon five and a phosphate and carbon three and a phosphate. And it's going to be important later on. So here again is DNA, another representation of DNA. You can just see four nucleotides. They've got A, T, C, and G for you there. Note that between A and T, there's two hydrogen bonds. Between C and G, three hydrogen bonds will form. That's in the middle there. Along the sides, look at the, see how, try to find the phosphodiester bonds. There they are. And then, if you look at the sugars, the sugars point in different directions. The oxygens are pointing in different directions. That is because DNA has anti-parallel strands. They link together only when the strands are facing opposite each other. So we call that 5' prime to 3', prime, or in this case the oxygens point 3 to 5'. So that will become very important to us later on when we're talking about how the code is read because it's read only in one direction. So again, how do you figure that out? You start at the oxygen, you count those carbons clockwise. One, two, three is your first phosphodiester bond and then four and five, that carbon that is not a part of the ring, is your five carbon. And so that's your five prime direction there next to the oxygen. This will probably be a review for most of you, but again, just to go over the base pairing rules for DNA, you've got A with T, T with A, C with G, G with C. That is a rule. It is always that way. We will discuss how they figured that out later on. Um, it was a chemist that laid the foundation for the base pairing rules. In RNA, you're going to have a single-stranded molecule rather than a double-stranded molecule. You will still have a phosphate sugar backbone, but it will be a ribose sugar instead. And the base pairing rules change a little bit. Uracil replaces thymine. So you're going to have those four bases in RNA. In DNA, you've got these four. So the only pair that changes is the uracil and the adenine. One more very important nucleic acid I want you to know, ATP. And here it is shown two ways. You've got your adenine group here, your ribose. So it is known as an adenosine for adenine and ribose. And then you've got your triphosphate, three phosphate groups there at the top. So to review, could you at this point pick out what elements are in each of these macromolecules? Well, the carbohydrate, carbohydrate, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, just like carbon and water. Lipids, also carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So how do you tell them apart? You look for those really long hydrocarbons, those chains of just carbon and hydrogen that are nonpolar, or you look for that classic cholesterol four-ring steroid or sterol structure. Proteins, they have amine groups, so they include nitrogen. Also, sometimes you'll see sulfur, so that's a dead giveaway that it's a protein. And nucleic acids have phosphodiester bonds, so they actually include nitrogen in the nitrogenous or nitrogen-containing base and phosphorus in the phosphate group. And so you're going to see all five of those there. So that nucleic acid should be very easy to pick out. I did want to do a quick recap of isomers since you read about them in the article. And you will see them in the macromolecules. Isomer is the term for all 
molecules that share a chemical formula, even though structurally they might be different. The mirror images, which the article was calling isomers, are a special class of isomers called enantiomers. And so we will build some of these three-dimensionally to help you visualize that, but I just wanted to go ahead and clarify those terms before we went any further into chemistry.